Rick, thank you so much for meeting me here. I have, have talked to Jenny Zeidman and gone over a lot of things, and I'm so happy to have you actually here because, unfortunately, as I understand, most of the crew, or all of them, are, are all gone. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Last man standing. I know maybe it's been a while since you told the story. Can you take me back to that and just try to, to remember the details? Who noticed something unusual first and what happened? We were about 2,000 feet above the ground. And we were flying, everything was copacetic, it was a clear night. And I think it was Janicek who, who said, gee, there's a, there's a red light in the eastern horizon and it's approaching. And I, then all of a sudden, the commentary increases in tempo. Uh, it seems to be coming right at us. It's, it's a red light, and it just seems like the intensity began to increase. So it was traveling relatively fast. Was it 600 knots? Was it 500 knots? I can't say. Is it 1,000? Who knows? But it was much, much faster than what we were used to seeing at that altitude on our regular flight. Boyne says, I've got the aircraft. Immediately, he went into a auto rotation, which in an Army helicopter, you cut the throttle, and you put the collective down, uh -huh. and you drop, and you drop pretty aggressively. But the helicopter didn't drop at all. Instead, it started rapidly gaining altitude, completely out of the pilot's control. Something happened. Something came in, and it, it, it rattled the crew. And I have no idea what it was. I only got to see the object who was directly above us. And what I noticed was a very bright white light. It was close enough to, to be of major concern. Yeah. It moved quickly. And I recall following it all the way to the horizon where it disappeared. And all of a sudden, we noticed that we were a little higher altitude than we typically would fly. After it passed, we got back to altitude. We flew back to Cleveland Hawkins and landed. First reaction was we contacted the FAA. They weren't flying. Every aircraft was, was down that day. Huh. With no flights airborne at the time of the encounter, the strange craft was truly an unidentified object. So we reported it as a, uh, a near miss, and that, that was the, uh, the official uh, position that, that, that was taken. I mean, and that's, <laughs> that's exactly what has me curious, is that um, something going clearly faster than 250 knots, below 10,000 feet, should not be doing that. Clearly unsafe, but what kind of conventional craft do you think possibly could be doing this? And one of the reactions that we had is it could it be an F-100, but uh, we didn't hear any noise. We didn't get into, you know, some turbulence or any of that sort. So it was, it was a different reaction that we, that we experienced as a result, had it been a conventional jet aircraft. It wasn't a meteor. I, I can tell you categorically it was not a meteor. And it wasn't hallucination. It was not a hallucination. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> Quite the experience. When you landed as a crew, you made the official reports, but did they do any follow-up with that? Did they find this concerning? No. Uh, there was no follow-up from the military at all. None at all. None at all. Wow. My puzzlement is why would the military, the FAA, not be more concerned to finding out? Well, I think the military uh, know a lot more than they say, but obviously they're not discussing it. Now, one of the things that true that happened was that the mag compass on that helicopter never functioned the same way as it did before. At times, it would just spin on its own. Really? And then it would stop. And it would point someplace that it shouldn't be pointing to. It was weird. It was replaced later. Unfortunately, that piece of hard evidence appears to have been destroyed and the story covered up. Did you ever talk to each other about, like, hey, should we talk to the public about this? There was some sensitivity about being embarrassed. I mean, who, who are these kooks who saw a UFO? That permeated some of the discussions that, that we had the next day. And Saturday morning, both Yanisek and Healy came out, and they both had sketched what they saw. And interestingly, both had sketched very similar objects. Wow. I, I, again, wanted to really thank you, Rick. It may not have been easy for you to, to come here today, but thank you for trusting me uh, and hearing your story. I really appreciate it. Okay.
Thank you. Ben is now convinced that the helicopter was somehow manipulated by the tic-tac-shaped UFO it encountered. But the question remains, how did the tic-tac achieve this and why? To find out, Ben is meeting with a local UFO expert who claims to have never before revealed info on the coin helicopter case. Hey, it must hey, be Tom. You? I'm Tom. Nice to meet you. So, thank you so much for meeting me here. I'm really interested to first know, how did you get started in investigating the coin copter case? One thing that really made me start digging in this whole case, you've got trace evidence from mechanical issues on the helicopter. I'm a pilot, and when, when you do maintenance on any aircraft, that maintenance follows the, the aircraft for the life of, of the plane, the helicopter you're required to. You're right. Do you know if uh, the military made official documentation of, of those effects on the craft or what happened to it afterward? Well, here's the problem. When you dig into it, you find out that the compass was swapped out. Uh -huh. And after 90 days, they threw away the documentation associated with it. After, wait a sec, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. So what about the crew? Did they debrief them on the whole thing? Well, that's another interesting thing. So it took like six months for eventually a disposition to get filled up with like the FAA, where they documented everything that happened. And I asked Healy and Janicek both about that document. I said, does the military mind you talking about this? as long as we stay with the story. Mm -hmm. So basically, what they were saying is, as long as I don't vary and kind of become very opinionated on everything and I just stay mm -hmm. with the script, they're fine with me. Huh. So I'm like, that's unusual. Uh, what happens to the helicopter after that? Well, that one to me is a good question because that's your biggest piece of physical evidence. Right. I track down the tail number, find out that the helicopter was pulled out of service reassigned another number and sent to Columbia. I found WikiLeaks documents really? to that effect. Yes, this helicopter in March of 2009 mm -hmm. crashed, killing all four crewmen on board. And wasn't because it was shot down. Huh. What if this helicopter had ongoing mechanical issues? What if you found maybe magnetic effects on a helicopter all these years later. Based on Tom's research, is it possible that the 1973 UFO encounter damaged the helicopter, which in turn caused it to crash years later in the jungles of Columbia? Awesome, Tom, you have given me so much information. Thank you. Thank you.